The Bible says that none of us are good. Hmm. The Bible also says that women aren't allowed to speak in church. The Bible also says that people with disabilities cannot approach God. The Bible also says to stone women who aren't virgins when they get married. The Bible also says to take your disobedient children out to the streets and let all the neighbors stone them to death. The Bible also says that if two men are fighting and one of their wives sees it happening and goes to defend her husband, she's to have her hand cut off. The Bible also says that without the shedding of blood, God can't forgive sin. The Bible also says to walk up to neighboring cities that don't belong to the nations nearby and to either enslave them or kill them all, and then take the women and children as plunder. The Bible also says that you should be stoned to death if you accidentally work on a Saturday. The Bible also says that unless you hate your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, and yourself, you can't serve Jesus. The Bible also says that if you look at someone with lust, you should rip out your own eyes. The Bible also says that if someone steals from you, you should give them more things to steal from you. The Bible also says that if somebody is attacking you, to let them continue attacking you. Don't fight back. The Bible also says happy is the one who takes your infants and dashes their skulls into rocks. So why again should I care what the Bible says? Yikes. You sound like you got manipulated by the biggest narcissist ever. The devil really got in your head, huh? See, rather than trusting God's words, which says that God is good and all of his ways are good, you sit there and internalize lies from a serpent. You then go and propagate these lies. This story sounds familiar. Oh wait, maybe it's because it already happened and is still happening today. You see, the same deceptive snares that Satan used to trick Eve in the garden, he's now using on you and your followers, and you're falling for it. This is exactly why the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. I'm going to go ahead and clear up these lies because you took every verse out of context. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is talking about women who want to forcefully take authority or power away from men. These were not godly women at all. They didn't even submit to God. Paul was also addressing a particular issue with women in church at that time. This doesn't mean women are to literally be silent, or else in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wouldn't say that women can go ahead and speak in church so long as they're wearing the proper attire. Leviticus chapter 21 lays out the standards for God's priests. You see, God draws a parallel or a correlation here between spiritual and physical perfection. You see, nothing defiled or impure can approach God because God himself is holy and pure. You see, physical disabilities are only a result of sin which came when man fell. Therefore, it makes sense that as a priest, you are a representative of God. And so there can't be any physical, spiritual, or moral impurities within you. Because when people see you, they see God, and God is perfect. This is why this mandate was given. And this was also under the Mosaic Law, which we're no longer bound to anymore. Deuteronomy chapter 22 shows how seriously sexual purity is to be taken. And this is because intercourse is the most powerful way to establish a covenant after bloodshedding. This is why casual sexual relationships never last. A woman lying about her virginity would have entered the covenant of marriage under a false pretense and would therefore bring shame to her husband, his family, and her family. It also shows that the woman doesn't honor nor have respect for the marriage covenant. The marriage covenant is the most important covenant we can have, and this is because it is a symbol of Christ and his bride. Therefore, God doesn't take it lightly when people sin and make a mockery of it. You conveniently left out the rest of Deuteronomy chapter 25. But anyways, in this scripture, we see that God is saying if a woman sees her husband fighting with another man, and if she attempts to give her husband the advantage by grabbing onto the genitals of that other man and damaging it, then she's to have her hand cut off. Why is this, you may ask? A man's genitals are his reproductive organs, and so by a woman damaging it, she is jeopardizing his ability to propagate his seed. She would effectively end the man's bloodline over a petty dispute. This is a serious offense and therefore her punishment is of equal measure. In exchange for mutilating his genitals, she gets her own hand mutilated, that same hand that was used to grab onto the man's genitals. Deuteronomy chapter 21 is talking about a very stubborn and unruly child. This is not a small baby. This is a child who doesn't listen, doesn't accept correction, and repeatedly causes strife and chaos. You see, the Old Testament lays the standards for God's righteousness and perfection. God was setting an example here. Evil will not be tolerated. And so rather than allow a persistently disobedient son to continue to dwell amongst the Israelites, the right thing to do would be to put that person to death so that they do not grow older and cause more evil. You see, we all have sinned and we're all subject to the death penalty. The difference is we have grace through Christ. 
Hebrews chapter 9 says that sin cannot be forgiven without the shedding of blood in the same way that a crime cannot be punished without a conviction resulting in someone being sent to prison for that crime. Crime needs punishment and sin needs atonement. If you have a problem with this, I highly suggest you go somewhere where the law is not strictly enforced, crime is not punished, and the judicial system is not strict on cracking down on crime. Deuteronomy chapter 20 says that the Israelites should go ahead and make a peace treaty first when they come across uh, neighboring cities and towns. Now, if that peace treaty is rejected, these neighboring inhabitants are effectively making a declaration of war. Now, obviously in war, there are casualties and there are captives. God allowing the Israelites to take these women and children is actually showing mercy because they would have otherwise died in battle. But this way, they get a chance to live. In Numbers chapter 15, we see that observing the Sabbath was an important sign of honor to the covenant that God established with his people. Failure to observe this important symbol of the covenant was a serious breach of the relationship and was punishable by death. And up until this point, Israel had a track record of either disobeying or forgetting God's commands. Luke chapter 14 tells us that we must be willing to break off worldly relationships if we want to seriously pursue Jesus. And this is because we can't let any person get in the way of our salvation. Matthew chapter 18 is a hyperbole. Jesus was saying that if you suffer with lust or dishonesty or any of these cardinal sins, then you must get to the root and cut it off at the root. You have to remove the external source that is causing you to sin. Otherwise, you allow yourself to continue to perish spiritually and physically because you continue to fall into this sin. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek in Matthew chapter 5, he was saying that vengeance belongs to the Lord. Refusing to retaliate in these situations actually demonstrates trust in God who cares for us and works through us in the world. You see, these attacks give God the opportunity to demonstrate his strength and goodness. Psalm 137 was written in the context of the Jewish exile in Babylon. You see, the Israelites had been taken as slaves after the Babylonians burned down the city of Jerusalem. And so the Babylonians had killed the Israelites and slaughtered their infants. The writer here was expressing an intense emotion that is rooted in a desire to see justice. And in this case, justice required the death of his enemies. The writer wasn't actually rejoicing in the unprecedented bloodshed of babies. You know what's funny though? You're going to use this line to try and say that the Bible is evil and this and that. Meanwhile, you guys are the same people who fight so heavily for abortion, which is quite literally the unprecedented, unwarranted, innocent, and cruel bloodshed slaughter of children in the womb. Unbelievable. If you're going to attempt to criticize the Bible on the basics of ethics, your argument collapses because the Bible is the foundation of ethics. Just look at the Ten Commandments.